Welcome to this week's Treasury Career Corner podcast, where I interview treasury professionals about their treasury careers. Each and every week, I talk to treasurers about how they build their careers, where they are now, where they see both themselves and the treasury profession going to next. And a special thanks to Flywire, our fantastic sponsors. If you've ever wondered whether there was a way to ease your international transaction hassles, they're the guys to talk to. If you follow the link in our show notes, you can see me talking to my mate Greg Levin, their senior VP of sales. I get to ask Greg about who are Flywire and how they can help you and your treasury team with your cross-border payment headaches. Just follow the link to the interview in today's show notes. And now let's get on with the show. In this week's show, delighted to be joined by Bruno Lorry, the Group Treasurer at Ferrero International. Now, we've been meaning to do this for many weeks, but Bruno's been very busy, obviously, as the treasurer for an amazing company. Founded in 1946 by Pietro and Giovanni Ferrero, the Ferrero Group is a family-owned business in its third generation. And as I said to Bruno earlier, very popular with my son and my kids as well. They have amazing products, including Nutella, Tic Tacs, Ferrero Rocher, Kinder Surprise, sold everywhere in more than 170 countries loved by generations around the world 2015 you entered a new era of acquisitions again buying lots of different businesses 2021 actually the group was the confectionery company with the best reputation in the world according to RepTrack so amazing company but what I want to do is dive into Bruno's career he and I have known each other well for many years Bruno if you would you take us back to the beginning how you first discovered May finance treasury up to now. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And indeed, it's a delight to be on the podcast. Great. Yeah, so I actually started my career at Swift, which was a, a kind of a very interesting starting point to be in the finance of Swift and of the interbank network. So I, I was working for a couple of years as, as in financial control, so much more in general finance, controlling different categories of, of PNL. And I think that's how I got the first time, let's say, in the the treasury, let's say, more indirectly through PNL control through some of the projects, and that's also I started to meet people that that were actually more specialized in in, in treasury as well. So that was a, a very good first step, uh, introduction step for me in finance, and that got me interested to move into the world of the treasury. So at the time, PwC was uh, starting to develop their consulting treasury arms. So they were actually relatively small treasury consulting teams, and they were really trying to expand. The, the European, let's say, center of expertise was in Brussels. Yeah. So that's pretty much how I met Sebastian Di Paola and the PwC treasury team. And that's pretty much how I got into the treasury from the consulting side. I always say it's unbelievable because it Coming from the consulting, I was able to see in kind of three years' time so many different environments. It, it was like going back to school. I, I think we always discuss about the fact that there are not so many treasury-specific trainings or certifications. So there are certifications, but more at university, yeah. like, like a student-type training in treasury. But I must say from my side, this was really getting back into a treasury university type of application. Like a, like, so, like a, a three-year apprenticeship, because you're getting to see the totally. good and the bad, yeah, yeah, and exactly learning from them. Plus, I got really an international experience from the start. I think, funnily, given the fact that now I'm based in Luxembourg, my one of my first uh, clients was based in Luxembourg, and I spent three months there, and I started to do uh, more of the business process side of system implementation. So that was really interesting. Then I moved to to a bank where we were looking at every everything that was linked to risk management, the ALM, and the way that derivatives were value, valued uh, or the valuation of derivatives and their accounting. And then after that, I moved to the Nordics where we did energy companies. We had some other, let's say, assignments in, in sports companies, paper companies. It, it was really going pretty much all the industries yeah. and looking at the really different aspects of the treasury. It could be organization. Sometimes it was the capital market, risk management, and a lot of times everything that was really trendy, let's say, at that time, which uh, was edge accounting. So at the time, it was really the full rollout of edge accounting. So I think it's, uh, I typically say in consulting, 
there are two areas that are probably the entry point to the discussion with corporates. It's often compliance, edge accounting, or you can say EMIR now, or maybe some of the other regulations that, that come into force. Uh, if there's a payment directive, for example, or the other side is technology. Because typically technology, you get a, a new package or you want to install a treasury system. Typically, it's an extra effort that requires to get in touch one way or another with a consulting company. So I did this three years, but from a personal standpoint, I was traveling like 80% of the time. So this was getting a little bit of crossroad of choosing what, what path, yes, what to do next. And I before think you, that... Uh, on, before, I just want to reflect a little bit on your PwC time, <laughs> because the good thing is you haven't named any clients in there. If, if you like, so you got to see the good, the bad, and maybe the ugly and things of that, doing that in a nice way, or maybe not so much. You, when you saw that without any naming names, what were the good bits of a treasury? And when you see the dysfunctional treasury, what did that give you? Because it's a great foundation for yourself. So I think I, I had to see uh, really very strong organization structures. Yeah. So I think some of the treasuries out there are uh, still from today's standard, uh, amazingly well organized. Should it be in bank relationship? Should it be in the approach to the system? Should it be in the approach to the risk management? So you could really see later, at a later stage in, in my career, when I went back uh, in the treasury consulting with Accenture, one of the things that we were trying to build is what does good look like? Yeah. You, you, had a, you could have a slide uh, that was saying, okay, in that field, what is the minimum you need to reach? Or what is a good average practice? And what is the best practice? Yeah. I would say from an organization structure, I saw really organization structure that in my view still uh, today, I can really think are best practice. Yeah. I saw the treasury strategy, treasury system strategies that were really, in my view, best practice at the time, and also right. risk management as well. So that was very interesting on the side of what is less, let's say, Less good or, or a bit yeah, more challenging. I, I would say typically I always thought uh, were not very agile. They were not extremely fast at evolving. I think typically the structure themselves, it seems like when you were getting a treasure, you were getting him until retirement, basically. So there was not a lot of cross-fertilization or uh, between finance and treasury. So that means that these organizations, they seemed in a way often a bit old-fashioned because they were not evolving much. I would come back 10 years later and probably it would be the same, same thing structure in way. You pick up your report from 10 years ago, oh, brush off the dust, it's the same thing. Exactly. Right. And it's a treasury problem typically that I think there are not so many positions, there are not so many, there are some levels of development opportunities within the treasury but if your company itself is not evolving very fast, like being it because it's acquisitive or because it's growing from being small to huge, like some of the biotech and all that, yeah. then typically you don't find a lot of opportunities for your team to really evolve. So unless you get some of these, it's the pyramid. It's a bit like in consulting in a way, but in consulting, there's much more churn because uh, it's not only the, the, the people that are junior who leaves, but also probably the middle management or the directors within consulting, they leave to go into corporate or they go to go and open the practice in another before. I think in corporates, in finance, it's a little bit easier because there are more areas. In treasuries, because it's specialized, I think this aspect often needs to be built. I saw very few treasuries that had very good rotations between finance and treasuries and that were taking the risks to bring people uh, from finance to treasury or the risk to move people from treasury to finance. Yeah. And that, I think, is a miss of, or if I can call that our industry, it's, in my view, one of the biggest problem of, of the industry. Well, I want to come back to that as well, because... So talk about the next moves and things, and we will we'll pick up on that subject, because I love it. So yes. Yeah, so, so I went back into corporate world yeah. because... I think I always am a little bit, in my, from my point of view, in between the corporates and the consulting. So that's why for me, finding corporates that have a lot of projects or growing a lot are typically my sweet spot. Because when I was in consulting, I was missing quite a bit to see the end of my projects or they were running. Because that's typically to a point where you, you have your deliverables, but then you don't see the, the running product or if you see it very shortly. So going back into a corporate was always great because you would see the process running, you would learn from that. There are a lot of things that you can catch uh, from the consulting side still from a granularity point of view. But then when you're in a corporate, you have to find a way to deal with the speed. And, and mm. also the, at the end of the day, 
the ideas transforming into projects, transforming into implementation and being successful, it can take a pretty long time and you can maybe have rates of projects that are pretty low versus the ideas you have, for example. So that brings you back to, at least in consulting, that doesn't happen because you get there at a stage where the projects approve, it will start, I'm not saying it will be always successful, but you don't have that, all these ideas that you need to stop or delay or, or negotiate for. Yeah. So going back into corporate was for me also very interesting because I, I at Levi's, I could see really all the different sides of treasury function at the time were like the EMEA APAC treasury. So it was also a pretty international treasury, a very, very strong team, a, a lot of, uh, yeah, a, a, a lot of skills and a lot of, a lot of activity, very dynamic, very agile. So I managed the, the back office there first, uh, then I managed the, the back and the middle office. And then at the end, I managed more the operations like trading side from it. It was a, a bit of a dream scenario to be able to see uh, back, middle, front, an environment that was uh, pretty active covering a lot of countries, covering cash, covering risk management. I think it's, I think from my point of view, it was really a great development to see that from the corporate side. And then you moved through, you made a move. Talk us through the next couple of moves because you were yes. talking and yes, no, in, in Eton. And I think the next, in the next move, the funny thing is that I got this offer to try to rebuild a treasury consulting, let's say, arm for Accenture. And I was pretty interested by it because uh, I think it was one of my uh, ex-colleagues at PwC who was uh, also leading the, that stream and some other finance streams. And it was like getting back into the PwC mode, but yeah. having to build it. So it was a very exciting idea, even though I, I knew the shortfall sometimes of consulting, but I was very interesting to, to build it. The, the challenge of the, the, that was not so much, the, let's say, the project by itself, it was more the timing. So I pretty much changed just before Fortis and other banks went bankrupt, just before the crisis there. So pretty much I joined and three weeks later, three or four weeks later, for example, there was a Euro finance, I think at that time. And the whole Fortis stand was, booth was empty. I don't know if you remember that one, yes, but there was nobody. Oh. The booth was there yeah. because of course they had been going bankrupt or yeah. restructuring probably a couple of weeks before. So they could not cancel the booth, but there was nobody. And it was the same for every, everything that was into consulting, IT consulting and all. I think it was a big shock. So at the end of the day, I did a very interesting project. I think I did a couple of system implementation in France where I was supporting the business process part. I even did a cost management project for a US company where I was really impressed by the, the, the competencies of Accenture in that field that I didn't even know, transforming PNL into cost categories, benchmarking them. And it's a stream that I had never seen before. But the reality is that, of course, it was a shock for the industry. They were lot, in restructuring yeah. mode after two or two months. So there was absolutely no way that they were going to build that team at that time. So right. after, yeah, it's good. Well, I was going to say, I know it firsthand and you mentioned about Fortis and things like that. And some of our listeners won't even know what that is. They won't know, you know, it was 20 years ago. But we were just, when people say when I recruit in the U.S., Oh, how long have you been here? I said, I've actually been recruiting in the US for like 15 years. I said, oh, really? I said, yeah, we first tried to come into the market in 2008-09. And they're like, oh, what was that? I said, it was empty. <laughs> I said, it was yeah. the stand. It was the subprime crisis. Everyone was like, we got to one of the conferences in Miami and there was an empty room. And I was just like, where is everyone? They said, yeah, everyone's not coming. I'm just like, and it was like tumbleweed going out of the room. And I'm there with the team going, we might as well go home. It was just, yeah, terrible. This were now we can look backward and say, okay, we were there at that time and it yeah, was we survived. unbelievable. But, but yes, at the time, it was a very strange time. So knowing that there was absolutely no way that this would get built in the yeah. next probably couple of years. And by the way, that team actually moved back to a big four as well. So there was more right. than that after that old idea of having financial consulting within a, more of an IT or BPO consultant never really continue or stop to be built and pretty much disappear from the scope even of their activities. So I was, so I had been doing jobs, even though I was traveling at PwC, a lot of the jobs were based in Brussels for, yeah. um, at that time. So I'd spent uh, pretty much the first 10 years 
of my career in uh, ba being based in Brussels. And I got this in the middle of this whole, let's say, thing, uh, experience, let's say, I, I, I got some calls to start to go to work uh, for Eton in, in uh, Switzerland. So at that time, uh, it, it actually felt like it was the right move. Of course, it, it was a bit strange to go, try to go and, and do that consulting development or business development and then move back to corporate. But the reality is that we knew, I knew at least that the consulting development would never happen over the next five yeah. years. And having an international experience in a setup that was very much in development as well. Eton was extremely acquisitive Can at you the explain, time. And as, explain yes. who Eton are for, again, yes. global multinational US. Who, who are they? What do they do? So Eton is a, is a global industrial company originally from the US and originally working more in, in vehicle group manufacturing parts like uh, yeah. valves or fueling systems. And in the beginning of the, the 2000s, they decided to reorient, uh, reorient it there or pretty much change slightly to become more diversified. So they decided to be much more electrical, which yeah. for the moment turns out to be a very good decision, and much more aerospace. So aerospace and, and electrical were pretty much the two areas where they invested a lot. So over the course of 20 years, they probably made around 60 acquisitions. So extremely acquisitive, really totally switching their sectors. Around 20 billion, around 100,000 people globally present. So what they were really building was at the time, they were really building the European side from the electrical sector point of view. So they had started to build a treasury in Switzerland to cover EMEA. And they were actually building the team or the function from scratch there. So from scratch, they had, they had started moving some people over and building that, but they were trying to expand it, basically. Yeah, and grow it. And, and, you, and, yeah. and you were there for 10 years growing it. So you started off in Switzerland, but then you took over responsibility for North America and actually went there as well, didn't you? So talk us through that. Yes. Yeah. So it was for me. The Levi's experience was good from a diversification or from a position point of view. I saw different sub-functions of treasury. The Eton was extremely interesting in terms of growing responsibilities, growing scope of should it be geographically or should it be from a team's point of view, growing the responsibilities and pretty much growing my experience as, a, as more of a kind of manager and then leader in, in treasury. So I started managing the, the operations in Europe. And, and then I became the director of the, the European uh, Treasury Center. And then when the director of the, the U.S. Treasury operations moved, I actually got appointed there with the goal to become the assistant treasurer for treasury operations globally. So at the time I moved function for the U.S., I knew already that, that the, the goal was to pretty much build the succession plan to manage the operations globally. So that was... Uh, of course, an extremely interesting development, and I think we, we did a, a lot of exciting things in, the, in all the fields in cash. We were starting to build uh, pan-European banking uh, relationships, and, and then we started to have more elaborated pooling structures, like multi-entity, multi-currency pools. Then we started to re-implement our treasury systems. It was very dynamic. It was very interesting. We had a lot of projects. Uh, the team was growing as well, growing responsibilities. We built a shared service center in, in India that was part of Eton Shared Service Center. We started to have a treasury shared service center as well. Then we built a, a compliance team that was like a more of a near shared service center in Budapest as well. And then... In the middle of all this, Eton acquired a company called Cooper, then inverted in Dublin. And then we had to build, let's say, a quarter treasury in Dublin as well. So it was very interesting. I had to pretty much to build three different locations from scratch. And then after that, I moved to the, the U.S. to manage the U.S. treasury operations, which is very different as well from Europe or even very well, different. Well, stop there. Great. So tell us how different it is or in your, you've done it firsthand. I saw, I've yeah. seen it firsthand, but... You've lived and breathed it. What was that like? And because we have a huge US audience and they often ask me, how is it different in Europe? How is it different in Switzerland? How is it? So how would you contrast the two? So I, I think in Europe and, and probably even more in emerging markets in Asia, yeah. we spend a lot of time trying to navigate through the different, different rules, different yeah. regulations. Then when we try to look at banking, we try often to look at cross-border banking and piece about functionality to operate in different countries. You will try to build a, a regional or a sub-regional banking partner. Then it becomes a lot also about the 
let's say, pan-European reporting, these things like Emir and all that. And, and so you, you deal a lot with, with the fact that you are uh, in a single area, but in a multiple, uh, with multiple countries. And, and uh, if you achieve to make all that work, that is, uh, is already a, an achievement to operate in a yeah, 10, 15, 20 countries environment and try to, let's say, improve some of these dynamics between the yeah. countries. I think in the US, on one side, you have a, a very a big advantage, one currency, one, one market, let's say, one, one clearing system and all that. But then you have a lot of other dynamics that come into the picture. You have the use of the checks, for example. You have the use of log boxes. You still have to look at, you look more at debit blocks. You look at your providers. So of course, they, they are typically deep domestic banking partners, but the, the specs or the requirements you have for them are, would be very different. Of course, some of them are similar cash, maybe having less accounts, sometimes virtual accounts nowadays and all. But what you consider a success is very different from European ones where if you manage to get this cross-country one region working, when in the US it's more, oh, try to look at the payroll, uh, try to maybe migrate some of the, the checks that are still being requested to, to cards or one one use cards, you see these kind of things or the logbox working or the debit blocks. These things, in my view, are very different approaches. You have the advantage of one currency, one country, but you have things that are still, let's say, a little bit more specific to the country that you would not see so much anymore in, in Europe. And one of the other things that I've had as feedback from some of our US guests, and I had a couple of weeks ago, and I was in New York and we're talking about that, is that, and this was, a, again, a European guy who'd head to the US, and we were talking about the fact that he was talking to the different parts of the business but sometimes it was different subsidiary businesses or different parts of the business and getting those guys talking to each other was his role as a treasurer, which he hadn't perhaps been, he'd been more treasury focused when he was in Europe. Whereas when he got to America, he was more business focused with treasury as like, not his sideline, but is in his backup that he had the treasury, but it was like doing that. Did you find that as well? Or? I did not find that that difference on our side uh, yeah. but for me what was very different is the fact that i was moving from a european headquarter into more of a pretty much the biggest office within the group of course with the inversion it was not the world headquarter but you had a lot of the central functions for the us for example operating there so i think the office was like 2000 plus people and i must say that it, it was very different to be in a regional headquarter yeah. and to be in the group headquarter. In the group headquarter, you could feel much more the pressure of having the, your management much closer in terms of decision about structures or about things to do. And even things like operating budgets of departments and all were a, a little bit, I would say, very different from being a bit in remote where I have the feeling that you were not so exposed to that. It was like the close to the sun uh, exposure. And so I, I felt it was very different from that standpoint, at least with a U.S. corporate. So that was, yeah, that, that was the biggest change for, from my standpoint at that time, because it's the first time that I was in a, the biggest decision center of a pretty huge group because yeah. it's a $20 billion company, a revenue company. And then you came to, to back to sunny London. And that's when I started to try and I was twisting Bruno's arm a few years ago to be on the podcast. And you came across and you joined Natura. Can you maybe talk us through that move and how that happened? Yeah, so we were happy to have, let's say, a, a U.S. experience from a family point of view. But the reality is that, uh, especially based being based in Cleveland, it felt very far from our families, very far from everything. And and I must say, uh, yeah, it's, we were still trying to probably think about getting a little bit closer uh, to, to our families and, and coming back on in Europe. And so Natura came with this very interesting, let's say, job proposal because Natura is a Brazilian cosmetics group originally in the direct sales. So they, are, they were a bit like a Tupperware or Avon direct sales concept in Brazil and then in five other countries in LATAM. So that was the origin of the group Natura. And then around 2012, I think they started to think about growing internationally. And first they bought a, a small cosmetics company in Australia called Aesop and developed it from there. And now Aesop... It's part of L'Oreal now, but it's been growing a lot. It's a 
very premium brand as well. So it was a fantastic success for Aesop, but for Natura as well. And now L'Oreal bought it from. And, and then they continue to expand, I think, in 2016, 2017. They bought the body shop. And the body shop is, yeah, unfortunately now in the news for other reasons. But it, it, they bought it from L'Oreal. And it was also like Aesop, more retail. So it was a direct sales company buying retail businesses. And, and that's how they grew at the time. They were still more managing this more as a holding. So they had no need to really go in the uh, functional side of the things. But they were actually, when they actually pitched me for that job, they were in the process of buying Avon. And Avon was a much bigger group because they were pretty much the size of Natura. So it was pretty much two groups of three, four billion of revenues that uh, were pretty much Avon would get acquired by Natura and get a percentage of the shares. And, and so because of that, there was... They were becoming much more international, but also they needed to build some of the functions. And one of them was treasury. And so the function, the, the, the position did not exist. The goal was that finance would be more based in London, even though there would be two big poles, two, two big centers of finance, London and Sao Paulo. But most of the finance management of the group would be based in London. And we would pretty much, the functional side of things, the treasury departments, how do we actually get them together, system harmonization, banking structure, risk management, everything that was related to debt capital markets as well, because of course we needed to operate as a group. And so for me, it was extremely interesting because first I'd never been in a setup like that, but also on my entire career, I focused at let's say 80, 90% on treasury operations. For me, getting into debt capital markets was actually, it's what you expect from a group treasurer to have both sides, but often you see a lot of people that develop one or the other side, yeah. and it's not very difficult to get a group treasurer role with a small exposure on one side or the other. And I think it was on their side. For me, I took the, the risk, let's say, of that new entity and all that. On their side, they definitely took the risk of my lack of debt capital markets knowledge. So we both trusted each other and we started working together in the, pretty much at the end of 2019. You did that for three years before joining yes. Carrera. What was that like? It was great. It was like uh, being in a bit of a, a startup mode. Of course, the challenge was that we got COVID uh, pretty much. First, we got the acquisitions in Jan 2020, so a bit before what we had anticipated, like in March. And then almost immediately after we got COVID and, and then everything became Marcus. different. I think all of a sudden we were discussing, of course, liquidity. Nobody knew at the time of COVID what would be their liquidity position, yeah. what would be the market. Do they have enough online presence? Do they sell enough through e-commerce? And it became very much in, in, let's say, a dynamic mode without having built really the structure at first and trying to build the structure in parallel. So yeah, so it was a, a very interesting experience, but it was also very challenging to build that uh, and to start that with a new company that you just acquired in the, middle of, in the middle of COVID. So I think we managed to really build a lot of the structures and we started to uh, bring a lot of the, let's say, concepts and projects that we wanted to bring to the table. For example, early 21, we did the first sustainability link bond for Natura. And it was, I think, at the time, the biggest in size for a Brazilian corporate. And that was also very interesting. Bring the ESG side, you see the old KPIs and try to organize the roadshow virtually, of course, yeah, and, yeah. and try to pitch to new investors, the ones that are a bit more ESG oriented as well, was extremely interesting. But we did a lot of refinancing. We probably did two, three refinancing, we refinanced the bonds. We had to negotiate with some of the, the minority holders of bonds. We had to do sustainability link bond, some financings in Brazil. For me, I really spent my time between the structure and that capital markets. So it was a total change uh, of job in a way. I had spent, let's say, 80% on operations and 20 more on, on the other topics. And all of a sudden, it was the total opposite. So it was also a great learning from that standpoint, because I probably, we refinance and, and reissued probably around 5 billion of bonds and finance things within two and a half years times. So that was very exciting uh, days, let's say. What then led, led to Ferrero? How did it happen? And so so it was, was interesting because I think originally I would have thought that also in these projects, you want to spend enough time, especially if you discount the, the COVID years, to do more, more of this job and try to complete more of these projects. But pretty much the turn of circumstance events changed that because Natura at some point in 2022, around mid-22, decided pretty much to 
exit international markets. So that's yeah. what they have done the year after. So they pretty much sold the body shops, all A's up, and pretty much and, and, and try to make LATAM work more in direct sales model. So they unwound the, the kind of omni-channel global model. And so when they told me that their, their goal at the time, they had not been implementing all that, but that, of course, our projects became frozen because there was no, as soon as they probably rebuilt that strategy and validated it, they communicated that from their point of view, that was not the new strategy in a way. So I think it was difficult to see how this matches with what I was doing. I was mm. doing the, I was trying to build a structure and all, and all of a sudden it would become back a, a Latam direct sales company. So it, co coincidentally, Fadi, uh, at the time Ferrero came uh, to me and, and wanted to discuss about the group treasurer position to, uh, to succeed the previous group treasurer was going retiring. So I think it was just an interesting, an interesting timing. And of course I was... For me, it was very interesting to go back into a private company as well, because Levi's was also private, but with a very different scale and, and a very different, a much bigger scale and also a very different pattern, much more acquisitive and also more also expanding globally. So it was, yes, it, it was actually a, a very interesting shift from one to the next, both in group treasurer's position. And then, and tell us about the structure there with, again, we know it's a private group, so I'm not, I don't want to delve too much, but it's more how's Treasury structured and how do you see the world sort of thing of Treasury at the moment? Yeah, so I think we, we have a, a pretty centralized Treasury yeah. function. So with uh, some regional hubs, we've done some Treasury, let's say, expertise in country that is more focused on cash and data. So it's a very interesting and, and impressive structure that, that was built the past 10, 15 years. Because, of course, the group continued to evolve between the regions, used to be very European, now it's very global. The U.S. became very big also with the acquisitions. So having to develop all this, created this structure with regional hubs and with a pretty sizable team in Luxembourg, also managing the, the group liquidity, the group risks, the debt capital markets. So I, I think it's, for me, I've been in the, at Eton and, and at Natura, I've been in environments where we had a lot of teams across the world that were often doing quite a lot of things, some bits and pieces of risk, some trade and cash, uh, pooling and all. Here, I must say that the, the strength is really that centralization. Having one team in Luxembourg that is dealing with most of it, that is sizable in the same office, for me, it's, I still see, I understand now we have also worked from home and all that, and that these aspects are, are present. They were not there probably 10 years ago, but, I, but still having everybody in the same office is still... A really very cool. a big plus from at yeah, least yeah. from a treasurer point of view and from the projects and all that we managed to brainstorm a lot of things to to try to implement and follow up a lot of things should be risk strategies and all that it's much easier than when you were in in calls with uh, five different locations and everybody yeah. was uh, in a different space here having the ability to go and talk to the traders and then after that to go and talk dcm strategy all this uh, the same day in a meeting room and, and try to get things out during the same week, I, I still think I would not be able to do that virtually so easily. And you talked there and, and you we touched on it two or three times that you're obviously a confectionery group. You're talking to the traders. The risks are very commodity-based a lot of the time, very naturally with a company like yours. And what's that like for you? Because obviously that's something that you perhaps haven't had quite so much as a treasurer and now you're front and center with it. What, what's that like for you? C correct. So I, I think, and, and that's why I say it's a, it's that's the beauty of treasury. It's a yeah. constant learning thing. So yes, indeed, I think there are sides where, of course, the acquisition brought into the picture, but the sub-function was less developed because of the transactions, meaning DCM got bigger because of the new acquisitions and all. And that's a side where, uh, because of Natura, I could bring some immediate, let's say, immediate expertise, which was good. And at the same time, I had to learn much more on the commodity side, the ag, and some of the specificities of confectionery, which was never the case before for us, because I think from Natura's point of view, you had a, a couple of, of commodities, uh, but this was often more dealt with in the procurement cycle through long-term fixed price contract or in packaging, you could maybe buy a bit of card, uh, cardboard paper and, and maybe a bit of energy, but there's nothing the size, of course, uh, a big group global and, and also in the confectionery manufacturing process. Really so for good. me, that's the big learning piece in, in this yeah. environment, yes. Again, before the show, we talked about other challenges that you as a treasurer face and 
what's top of mind. We touched a bit on systems and technology, and we would I'd said about a, a podcast I did recently with someone and talk about yeah, everyone's talking about AI, machine learning, but one of the other things from this is fraud, cyber, all the other things that you're having to deal with. That seems to be a little bit more top of my view. Would that be right? Yes, I, I think there's really a big focus on cybersecurity and, yeah. and fraud these days. So I think every corporate is trying to figure out what is the right path. And I think, uh, I'm sure you will also uh, interview or discuss sometimes with, uh, there are some of fintechs out there that are doing this. Some of the system providers try to integrate them in their com- connectivity packages. Uh, and then you have uh, the banks are trying as well to try to Either they do that for regulatory reasons, the pay identification in Europe, yeah. but also I think some of the banks are trying to go further than that in trying to also gather some of these databases globally or at least as far as they can reach out. So I think for us in that field, it was also it was relatively new because it's a pretty new field. It was interesting to try to see how, how do you try to build a strategy around that because there are different stages uh, uh, of checks and of uh, risks that are identified through the cycle. Should it be mm. the onboarding? Should it be uh, at the time of the payment? Maybe in the reviews time? So you have to try to figure out what is the best fit. I think we we try to build a, more of a strategy and a step-by-step approach this that goes from going from more the onboarding time to more the pe- periodic one and try to see what is the right path for us to do this continuous check you see yeah. the ones that some of the companies i was seeing i think siemens was showing a, a case about that where they had built an engine also to look at pretty much the odd transactions they were actually having an engine that was doing that at the time of the payment and i think it's definitely an area where i see most corporates would have to take a position about what they do when and for us because we are associated to banks and associated to payments th- there's no way that as a treasurer you have to integrate that in your strategy one way or another yeah you have to do it and you and i were catching up in a couple of weeks time at euro finance and the conference there are a var- variety of other sessions there and lots of different things anything else before we wrap up today that you think other treasurers you've listened to the podcast a few times what are the other areas you think other treasurers need to be thinking about? Yeah, no, it's a bit linked. I think we had the discussion a little bit at, at the beginning. For me, I'm always very interested to, to interact, to discuss with the, the treasury environment or the treasury networks in there, because there are so many different approaches. And I think most of them are a combination. But often you see a lot of a bit the cutting edge approach, the, the, the best system, maybe the best fintech, the best satellite system, the best bank, or I still think out there, we need to combine that with a bit what we were discussing before, which is the master, the basics yeah. part of it. In my view, I think you have to do your best and it's an imperfect situation. It will always be in balance. You just need to try to catch up and try to do your best on that. But on the process side, on the basics, should it be bank accounts, indeed, the, this payment process, signers, the way that you get the exposures, the way that you build the risk strategies, the procedures and all. I... In most of the environment that I've seen from the consulting, but also within the ones I worked with, I, it's something that is, in my view, a little bit overlooked. Is the mapping of your process care? Is your BAM current? What, what is the periodic review? In a way, it's the kind of approach of the fraud, but you have to apply it across the board. You have to look at onboarding, periodic, and how do you treat the ongoing... And then re-review uh, the and then yeah, exactly. keep that process going round and round. Yes, Amazing. And I think it's a, for me, it's a key thing that there are more tools, more bend more networking that can really help to try to figure out a little bit this discussion about the chart of Accenture. What is the minimum that you expect from an international treasury? What is at least the average practice that you see across there? And what is the best practice? And, and what is your path? And, and what are the, the milestones to get closer to best practice? I think if yeah, you manage to do that... You, you are getting a step closer to to being a, an excellent good treasure. Yeah, a perfect treasure, which you've seen. That's the good thing. You've got all that to bring it all together and everything else. Yeah, I, I've seen it. But the, the thing is that, like I said, it's always in balance. You see it in some areas and then you identify other areas where you think, whoa, this treasure was very focused on DCM. So the DCM was unbelievable. Wallet sizing, the bank relationship, very well organized reviews, but at the same time, you didn't care so much about the operations. So the operations were a little bit more area of, of improvement. And then some other guy could be huge at operations, was following on everything there, but he could probably make 
millions in the bank relationship management. Yeah, uh, so it's always in balance, in my view. It's, it's, as I say, when I go to the conferences, people ask me, they say, how come we've done 330 plus, 340 plus? I said, look, I've got 10 treasurers within arm's length of here. All of them do the same job, right? They've got the same job ties. And I went, no, they don't. I said, exactly. I said, they're debt laden, they're cash rich, they're centralized, they're decentralized. They do... And that's the variety of treasury that I think we get each and every week. And I know I got that from a couple of listeners recently when I saw them in the US and they were like, yeah, that's what we get from the show. For anyone listening today, we'll put in your LinkedIn details in the show notes as we always do. But what are the takeaways you're going to give to the audience? Maybe it's you 20 years ago, 10 years ago or now. What are you going to give to some of those treasury folks out there that you think they should be doing to enhance their treasury careers as it were? Yeah, I think from my point of view, as a kind of treasurer in development, let's say, you have always to be curious. I think there's nothing that is going to be replaced to be curious and to try to be agile with the things that you're facing. Another funny one, and probably a last one that, that I heard, I don't remember if I heard that from J.P. Dixon, J.P. Morgan, or the CEO of Mac McDonald's, I think is, and I think it should not be taken strictly, but he said the key to develop is to never say no. And I think in a way, they say that's why we should not apply it strictly because you will be exposed to a lot of things where you will be asked, okay, do you want to go to this country to open a new office or do you want to uh, take over uh, the DCMP says this or do you want to take over the front office when you come from the back office? And at that time, of course, the, you are going to question yourself. You're going to question, is it the right move? Is it the right move to go back in consulting if you have a, a much more experience there? But at the end of the day, if you start from the idea that you should not s say no from the start, you should more try to think more about it. Is yeah, it the right fit? Should no. I, could I make it work? Yeah. And so it's more about take things in an open way and try to build it in much more details. Try to see if you would, could you make it work? Would it be profitable or good for you to, to do that? Uh, would it bring you also fun at work and, and other things? And if you have that mindset, I think it's much easier to approach anything. I'm going to finish on those words. Bruno, looking forward to sharing a couple of beers with you in a couple of weeks' time. Thank you, sir. It's been amazing to chat to you. Me too, Mike. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Hello, Treasury professionals. Before you dive into the next episode, could you please help me continue to grow the world's only global Treasury salary survey? That's right, our one so you know your compensation is constantly benchmarked against the market. It's amazing, isn't it? Just go to treasurysalary.com. Takes less than two minutes to complete, start to finish. You then gain exclusive, regular, updated access to our salary survey, keeping you ahead of the curve. The survey is an evolving, breathing entity that constantly tracks the salaries of treasury professionals on a global basis. Currently, we have over 1,100 participants taking part at treasurysalary.com. Thank you for being such amazing loyal listeners. Your support is incredible. Couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Go to treasurysalary.com.